Thank you for joining us for the guest speaker series. This is a terrific presentation from the engineering students at the uh, University of Southern California. Uh, the Aero Design Team. I want to introduce uh, Addison, Tyler, and Aaron. So, guys, take it away. Great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Van Landingham. This is Tyler Gami. This is Addison Salzman. We're all seniors at USD studying aerospace engineering. And today, we're going to talk to you about uh, the Aero Design Team of USC. So we'll do that. I'll, I'll first briefly kind of introduce the team, then we'll talk about the contest that we compete in, and then Addison and Tyler are going to walk you through our 2016 year to kind of look at the design tools and analysis techniques that we use. And so we are a student design team affiliated with the university. So our team consists of between 40 and 50 undergrads and graduate students. We were originally founded in 1991 by Wyatt Sadler, who's an AMA member. And we originally competed in the SAE contest, which is, is kind of well known among uh, this crowd. But we have since shifted to the AIAA Design Build Fly Contest. And our, our year kind of revolves around that contest. So the actual competition is in mid-April, but rules are released in early September. And so throughout the year, we design, build, inevitably crash, occasionally fly uh, between six to 10 planes. Uh, and so that's, that's really what we're about. As you can imagine, that does get expensive, especially when you start to talk about the composites and uh, expensive components that do go into aircraft. So uh, we receive our funding through a combination of school, industry, and private donations. Uh, to, so looking at the Design Build Fly contest, it's an international competition with uh, approximately 80 teams from all over the world. Fundamentally, it requires the design and build of an electric-powered RC air airplane. So each year, they release a set of rules that dictate a series of flight and ground missions that you have to complete, as well as releasing a scoring equation that kind of constrains your design and, and ultimately uh, sets how your design is going to be optimized. So we always optimize to maximize score within that scoring equation. What's really cool about this contest and, and why we continue to do it year after year is that the rules change each year. And so each year there's a new set of design requirements and a completely new set of design challenges, uh, which makes us design completely different aircraft each year. So to kind of wrap your mind around the challenges that we face and, and hopefully try to solve, uh, we're going to walk you through some of our previous entrants. So our 2012 plane was Poseidon, which you see here. And so this plane was constrained primarily by a 4.4 pound payload. And kind of the interesting mission that year was that it had to carry two liters of water up to a height of 200 feet and then release the water in flight. So you can imagine that posed a, a series of stability issues for our aerodynamics team. We elected to go with a flying wing configuration, which you see here. Um, and, it, and it really is a, it's a beautiful plane. You can see it. We'll be, we'll be at our booth uh, all day. But uh, it looks good. So our 2013 plane was Sharkbait. And so this year, they had to do a speed mission, as well as for all the missions, they had to take, out, take off out of a 30 by 30 foot square. And so the payloads this year were pretty interesting. There were, we had to be able to accommodate a maximum number of payloads, but the payloads that we actually flew at the contest were determined by the roll of a dice at the flight line. And so we had to be able to accommodate payloads both internally and externally, as well as being imbalanced. So this year we went with a biplane configuration, and the reason we did that was because the aircraft dimensions were in the denominator of the scoring equation. So in an effort to maximize our score, we reduced our, the span of our aircraft uh, by going with a biplane configuration. And so that's the, that's the plane you see there. Our 2014 entrant was Mischief. And so this plane also had a 40-foot takeoff field length. And in addition to that, kind of the interesting mission that year was a taxi mission, which you can see in the bottom right. And we actually had to navigate a series of obstacles uh, while traveling on this corrugated roofing panel. And the way we did that was with uh, some carbon skids on a, on a bow gear that you can see on the bottom of the plane. And what was really, what kind of made this plane so competitive was that it was very lightweight. And so, Kind of the, the highlights of this design are the steerable landing gear, which was weighed less than 20 grams, as well as the Kevlar fuselage, which had a foam truss to transfer our landing and in-flight loads. So this plane 
Uh, looks really good when it's flying. We're really proud of it. It actually won first place in 2014. And so this is kind of the standard that we hold ourselves to uh, each year as we design our planes. As you can imagine, this, these planes don't come together overnight. We actually divide our year into three primary cycles. The first is our preliminary design cycle. So we take the scoring and the rules that are released each year, and we set a series of design objectives using score analysis. Uh, we also we do our preliminary sizing for performance, propulsion, and aerodynamics, and then we ultimately validate that preliminary sizing using kind of crude, scratch-built foam aircraft, just generally testing the initial design. Next, we move on to our critical design, where we're looking specifically at each component, um, looking at the materials and how it's all integrated, and coming up with a, a more refined design. So you'll see, as I flip through a series of pictures, we're, we're looking at uh, different configurations for the tail in this particular year, as well as what material the fuselage is going to be made out of. So we go from a V-tail here with a fiberglass fuselage to a V-tail with a Kevlar fuselage and then to a conventional tail with a carbon fuselage. Uh, we actually have this plane over on our table as well. But our last cycle is the competition build phase, which is where we're really looking at taking our critical design and refining our build techniques to make it as lightweight as possible um, and, and just being competition ready. And so that finishes with our competition aircraft, which we compete with um, in, in mid-April. So in order to uh, kind of specifically look at the tools we use, I'm going to transition to Tyler, who's going to talk about our 2016 year. All right, thank you, Aaron. So uh, last year was kind of interesting in the fact that we actually had to build two planes. So the idea here was that um, when a plane is manufactured or assembled, a lot of the parts are manufactured in different areas of the nation, distributed manufacturing. And to bring it all together, you have to transport these parts, usually using a bigger airplane. So what the contest wanted us to do was produce a plane that could carry individual components of a smaller plane and have us assemble it all together and then fly that plane as well. So that year, uh, we had three missions plus a bonus mission. Um, the first mission was just an arrival flight. So that big plane, our manufacturing plane, uh, flies by itself, uh, completes three laps, five minutes, very easy. Um, our, second, our second flight, the uh, transportation flight, was us flying the individual components of the plane and doing one lap one contest lap, which is just uh, one lap around a course with a 360 in between, um, flying all components. Our last flight was our uh, little plane flight, so what they called the production aircraft, flying a 32-ounce Gatorade bottle. Um, we, were, we were able to attempt all three missions. We didn't finish the last one, unfortunately. But what was interesting was the contest that year um, divided our score by the number of components that we flew. So. Since we were flying, since we were trying to maximize our score, we actually only flew with a one component airplane, meaning we built an airplane around a smaller one and only had to fly one lap on mission two, which was actually pretty awesome. The bonus mission was just between mission two and mission three. We remove our airplane from our larger aircraft, get it ready to fly, ready to go within two minutes, which we were able to do successfully. So, real summary, two planes, little plane and big plane. We were limited to a takeoff field length of 100, of 100 feet, which sounds like a lot, but really isn't. And uh, propulsion-wise, so a, a constant throughout every year in the contest is we can't use LiPo batteries. Uh, they say it's a safety issue, but really they're just trying to be difficult. So scoring. Um, the score that year was broken down into report score, total mission score, and RAC. What was interesting about our mission score was that everything was binary, meaning that if we completed the mission, we got a certain amount of points. If we didn't, we got you know a 0.1 or 0.2 multiplier just so we didn't score a zero. And so what we were able to assume is that our, we were going to get a perfect total mission score because we were going to finish all three missions. If we didn't, it didn't really matter. We were going to lose. For our report score, we always assume 100 because we're USC students and we're super smart. Just kidding. Um, we just you know think want to try and do our best. And then finally for our rated aircraft cost. So that was the main driver behind our score. Empty weight, battery weight, uh, number of components, plus the empty weight of our larger plane and the battery weight of our larger plane. Um, in order to kind of focus in on what we're going to do for the year, what we're going to, how we're going to design our plane, we do a score analysis. So what this is, is it's 
calculating our score based on some certain assumptions, taking into account all the scoring factors, so report score, mission scores, and RAC, and varying those factors, such as empty weight, battery weight, number of components, seeing how that affects the score. What this allows us to do is it shows us which variable, if we you know, design for, for, that, for optimizing that, whether or not that's gonna lead to a higher score. So, for example, uh, here we see an empty weight analysis. It shows us the lower our empty weight, the higher our score. Same with the battery weight, and these are both for our little plane. Um, as it turns out, our larger plane, it doesn't factor as much into the scoring. Same for the battery weight of our larger plane. And finally, number of components. Um, this graph looks kind of weird. That's because you can't have half a component, obviously. So, you know, it's a step function. Um, so what this told us is we needed to focus on the empty weight of our little plane, minimizing that as much as possible, the battery weight of our little plane, and finally build a one component airplane, which you can see up here. Um, so what that ended up being was we had a one component little airplane, we chose a flying wing because we thought it would be easiest to build another plane, plane around that, not having to worry about an em empennage or any kind of tail body. So now I'm going to hand it off to Addison Salzman, our performance captain. He's going to talk to you about uh, aerodynamics, stability, and uh, propulsion. All right, thanks, Tyler. So once we've done that score analysis, um, so that's kind of a high-level look at uh, what factors um, are going to influence our score the most strongly. Um, and from there, we take that and use it to inform um, some more detailed trade studies. Uh, so our analysis side of the team uh, is made up of performance, propulsion, and aero stability and control captains. Uh, the performance captain uh, primarily uses a software called Plane Tools. Uh, it's a team-built uh, MATLAB-based flight simulation package. Uh, it basically simulates uh, the whole competition uh, from takeoff, to climb, cruise, um, all the way to landing, um, and allows you to see um, not just how you know, the aspect ratio affects your cruise speed or your takeoff performance, but how does that, um, you know, how does all the changes associated with that from the weight to uh, integration affect your total score? Uh, so the performance captain is basically responsible for determining our wing sizing. Uh, and you can see uh, this is a trade study for uh, sizing the wing for this plane here. Um, so what we've done is assume a baseline plane, uh, just as the analysis in, that Tyler did uh, assumed. And then from there, we can vary um, several uh, parameters at once. Um, so each of these points where the lines intersect um, is a different wing geometry, so different area and aspect ratio. Um, and then we simulate that through the whole competition uh, and check that against any restrictions we have. So you can see these yellow dots um, are wing geometries that don't meet the takeoff limitation. Um, so we're checking against that. And then the highest scoring configuration that is able to complete all the missions um, subject to the requirements uh, is the one we, we choose. Uh, so from there, the propulsion captain takes that uh, wing geometry and kind of has a better idea of the performance requirements. Um, and for last year, the, the propulsion objectives, um, since the scoring was binary, were really just to complete the missions in the allotted time, um, generate enough thrust to meet our takeoff requirement, and reduce battery weight at kind of all costs. So to reduce battery weight, we looked at two different approaches. Um, one, uh, basically, you can go high voltage, uh, low current, which allows you to use a lower capacity and more lightweight cell, um, or you can go a lower voltage and a higher current, uh, which, allow, which uh, allows you to use less cells, um, but heavier individual cells. So through battery testing in lab, we tested uh, two different capacity cells. Uh, we determined for the same motor, propeller, and uh, battery pack voltage. Um, we actually saw that uh, the low capacity cells were limiting the current output um, just because of their construction. So as you can see, the, the low capacity cells, the CAN 700s, um, pretty greatly underperformed the Elite 1500s. Um, so that was the cell we uh, chose to go with. 
And then once the static testing and lab was done, uh, we put it on a plane and uh, flight tested that uh, propulsion package. Uh, so this is some flight data of our current throughout the flight. Uh, as you can see from the black line on top, our average cruise current um, was about 35 amps. Um, and our, our target cruise current, um, kind of our maximum allowable in order to fly as long as we needed to, was 28 amps. Um, so we, we then um, chose a, a higher power output motor um, with lower KV, uh, which reduced our cruise current and allowed us to uh, use battery pack um, that we had designed without adding any uh, additional cells or additional capacity. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Aero S and C captains, so stability and control, um, they they take the wing that the performance captain has given them, um, which is basically just a span um, and a wing area, which defines the aspect ratio. Uh, and they their job is to do the analysis um, of how do we make this plane uh, controllable uh, and stable in flight. Uh, so the way we did that was we we started by kind of taking. Poseidon, which is the, the red and yellow plane on the right um, from a few years earlier, kind of as our baseline, and looked at how we could tweak that to, to meet our performance goals. So because we had a shorter takeoff field length requirement, uh, we needed a higher maximum lift coefficient. So we looked at the performance of the root airfoil. Um, the blue airfoil on the right uh, was Poseidon's airfoil. Uh, and then the green one on the left was one with a higher uh, lift coefficient. Um, but as you can see from the drag polar um, in the bottom right corner there, that green airfoil had a much higher drag penalty associated with that. So our aero captain um, designed this MC1, which was kind of a, a happy medium to give us the, the right uh, maximum lift coefficient, but at a, a lower uh, drag penalty. Uh, but for a flying wing, um, since there's no empennage um, to give you uh, static stability, uh, basically all of that comes from uh, your airfoil construction. So this is a plot of the pitching moment. Um, so basically uh, the, the blue airfoil was the, the baseline and the red was the redesign. So as you can see, there's a much stronger pitching moment um, for this redesigned airfoil. And so that required um, a stronger pitching moment in the other direction for the tip airfoil. So as you sum along the wing, um, you end up with um, something close to um, zero pitching moment. So as you're flying, your plane doesn't have a tendency to pitch up or down, uh, it stays level. Uh, for the big plane, that was an interesting challenge uh, because the design was basically determined entirely by the build team, um, which for an analysis lead, that's kind of your worst nightmare. Um, so the challenge was how do we take a plane with the exact same incidence, twist, and span, increase the cord by 35%, and maintain stability. Uh, so what we did was we looked at the planes in AVL, which is a software developed by Mark Drella from MIT, um, who's a longtime AMA member. Um, and so we used that to look at the stability characteristics of the aircraft. Uh, this is a root locus plot of the big plane. So this is there's a lot of math that probably none of you actually care about um, involved in this, but this basically shows uh, what your natural frequency and damping is for your different stability modes. Um, the important thing, and a heck of a lot easier to wrap your mind around, is in that right column, um, that's the performance as compared to mil-spec criteria. Um, so you're, there's three levels um, for the flying qualities, um, and you really want to be at level one for a controllable airplane. Um, and we were able to, to do that. Um, so now to talk about um, probably a little more of what you guys are interested in. Um, how do we take all of this um, from the concept and all this analysis um, and actually build it into an airplane that flies? Um, so I'm going to hand off to Tyler to go through that. Thank you, Edison. So um, our, we're very lucky at USC to get access to a lot of materials uh, that you know allow us to build these really nice or really functional fuselages and structures and whatnot. So for our little plane fuselage, we decided to go with a monocoque construction two-part mold. Um, it's Kevlar and fiberglass. So the Kevlar gives you a nice strong skin that doesn't tear too easily and the fiberglass lends a, a bit more structure. Um, so like I said, a two-part mold. We made that mold by uh, cutting out a foam buck, so a male model basically, and uh, 
covering that in a little bit of monocoat, a very smooth uh, plastic that makes a nice mold release, and fiberglassing over that until we got the, these two nice mold pieces. Um, it really gave us this nice aerodynamic fuselage that uh, was pretty easy to reproduce over and over again. Little plane wing. Um, so we do a lot of foam uh, construction with our planes. Uh, it was no different this year. But what was kind of unique was that we were trying this new thing where we'd scallop the back of the wing, kind of hollow it out a little bit, and replace that material with balsa ribs and monaco. What that does is it lends to a much lighter construction. And since the competition is always based on weight, we were actually able to increase our score a bit here. Um, the foam portion of the wing is covered in fiberglass. There is a carbon fiber spar, spar cap on top and bottom. So that's at the quarter cord. And for those of you who don't know, that's where your maximum aerodynamic pressure is going to be. So your maximum stress and whatnot. So we like to reinforce there a little bit more. Um, the foam itself is two-pound extruded polystyrene. It's really easy to work with. It's really easy to cut with a hot wire cutter. Um, and it's fairly light and, most importantly, very structurally sound. Little plane landing gear. So our landing gear this year was very simple. Um, steel rod bent to whatever shape we needed it to be. Well, the main thing we took away from this landing gear really was that we really need to focus on landing gear. Last year was the first time in a while where we didn't have an actual landing gear captain or lead. And what we told ourselves was, you know, this isn't that complicated. The structure's captain can handle all of it. Like, let's just give it to him. Don't worry. Well, the fact of the matter is that guy really couldn't handle. Like, I mean, landing gear wasn't that great. What are, that structure's guy just wasn't doing that his job. Of course, that guy was me, so um, yikes. And so this year, what we told ourselves is, all right, we're going to be solid on landing gear. We're going to make a landing gear captain. They're going to focus on it all year. You know, we're going to we're not going to have the same problems on takeoff and landing as we did last year. And what does the competition do? Hand launch planes. So, um, like I said earlier, with our big plane construction, we, decide, we, we decided to build one plane around another. Um, so as you can see, uh, the big plane is kind of just an outer skin for our little plane. We have a bunch of different appendices just to cover up our landing gear and prop of our little plane. Our fuselage was basically the same construction. So that back, back yellow portion right there is Kevlar and fiberglass. There's a bit more carbon fiber on the front because as you can see, there's that big slot in the nose of the plane to account for our prop. What that carbon fiber does is it lends a little bit more structure, keeps everything a little bit more rigid so that our nose doesn't crumple because of the big hole. Um, and then you can really see on the side, but we have these flanges that allowed us to actually bolt the wing down onto the fuselage. And this made it really easy to remove the wing and, you know, insert and uh, take out our little plane and load it over and over again. So this was something new that we tried this year, a hollow wing. It was a two-piece wing um, with a foam core, but sandwiched with uh, various composites, mainly carbon fiber and fiberglass. So how we did this was we cut out our wings from these big blocks of foam and used the remaining foam as kind of a mold surface. We'd cover it with this nice flashbreaker tape, which also makes a very nice mold release surface. Um, lay up the wings on those beds pull them out, and then join them at the leading edge. It was actually a lot of work. And unfortunately, they did come out pretty heavy, which was kind of where what, something we didn't really see coming in our initial design. We decided on a flying wing pretty early when it turns out that uh, while it, was, it might not have been as simple to you know, kind of build around a monoplane or something with an empennage, it was a lot lighter just because of all the things, all of the weird geometries you didn't have to worry about with the monoplane. So uh, th these are kind of a video of some of our missions. So these were the successful flights. We did fly a few more um, less successful ones. Um, so this is mission one, just a simple empty, empty flight. Um, as we said earlier, scoring was binary, so we're not going that fast, kind of just getting the missions done. This right here was mission two, so 
you might not be able to tell, but there is actually a plane loaded inside that plane. We take off. And again, this was another successful flight. We're very lucky. And thankfully, that was considered a landing. All right, so this last one. So what's really great about our team is no matter what, we always land the plane. Now, in what condition is, well, you'll see. So this was actually probably the best flight we'd ever gotten out of this particular plane all year. And, um, you know, just zipping around the, the field. But what happened there, unfortunately, was we were trying to do a 360 degree turn in uh, 20 mile per hour winds. And as soon as we hit that um, upwind leg right there, the stress on our aileron was probably the highest it had ever been and it actually snapped the servo out from the wing. So we lost aileron control almost immediately and unfortunately spiraled into the ground. But what was amazing was, as you can see, we have this plane right here. We rebuilt the entire plane in one night. So that was in our hotel room, basically throwing, to, throwing together spare parts, and we were able to at least try and get a flight attempt in the next day. So I, was, I mean, me personally, I was very proud of our team that night. So uh, I'm gonna pass it back off to Aaron. He's gonna give you a competition overview and kind of wrap it up. Great, so uh, as Tyler showed you, uh, we did successfully complete, for better or for worse, the design that we set out uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, you saw a number of difficulties with uh, the landing gear and uh, the unsuccessful flight for mission three uh, that really crushed our, crushed our hopes. Um, but on day one, we successfully completed mission one. On day two, we successfully completed mission two as well as the bonus mission. And on day three, uh, we, success we <laughs> attempted mission three but were unsuccessful as a result of the uh, servo. And so as you can see, uh, we finished in 16th out of 80. Um, we have kind of done the math and, and if we had successfully completed mission three, we would have finished closer to the top in the top five. Uh, and so I think that really is a testament to the original design that we developed. Um, I think it, it kind of shows that, that we are a, a high level team, particularly in terms of the analysis that we do. Um, and I think really kind of validates the year. Um, so, so we were proud of, of taking on that challenge and, and really executing a difficult design uh, throughout the year. Just to kind of bring the whole contest full circle, I wanted to show some of the, the competition that, that we do face. So uh, you can see Georgia Tech showed up with a very well-designed, very well-built set of conventional monoplanes uh, with Hershey bar wings. So you can see their little plane on the right that actually nested inside uh, the big plane. And so they pulled off those uh, balsa wings and kind of nested them around. It was a very well executed, very well designed plane. They finished in second that year. Additionally, we had Cal Poly who executed very well a balsa flying wing similar to our design. And they, that's their little plane there, but they actually nested their big plane over it, very similar to, to what we did. Um, but really that is kind of the, the fun of our contest is that uh, we, we are all trying to win, it's all very competitive, and, and I think that really pushes us to come up with clever, creative designs that really push our abilities as students, as engineers, uh, but also as, as builders. And um, so, so really that is kind of the, the fun of the contest, that's why we like it, and uh, that's why we continue to do it. So uh, that's all we have for the presentation. I hope uh, that kind of gives you an overview of what we do and, and what we're about. If you have any questions, we're happy to take them right now. Um, otherwise, we'll be at our booth all day, so thank you.